Once my son is gone, you'll be going back to your parents' place, right? We'll live in this house then. My dear husband had suddenly passed away. Right after the funeral, while I was engulfed in sorrow, my husband's parents came to see me. Even though it's not much, this house is filled with memories of living with my husband. Why do I have to leave? But mother-in-law, without a moment's pause to let me wipe my eyes, bluntly said that. My name is Susan. I'm an administrative worker at a real estate agency. My meeting with my dear husband, David, was facilitated by the real estate agency where I work. David was the brother of my male colleague, Michael, and they were very close. Since their workplaces were near, David often visited. As I worked in the same administrative role, I grew close to Michael, who would later become my brother-in-law. This connection led to Michael introducing me to David. Gradually, David and Michael started inviting me for lunch, and we began spending more time together. I thought of David as a cheerful, nice guy with whom I shared a lot in common, but I hadn't seen him in a romantic light. I assumed he felt the same, until one day, when everything changed. We were supposed to meet at a restaurant Michael had reserved, but he had a sudden emergency and couldn't make it. It seemed wasteful to cancel the reservation, so for the first time, it was just the two of us. I later found out that this was arranged by the brothers, with Michael conspiring to give David and me some alone time. The food was delicious, and our conversation flowed. We quickly became close, discussing our backgrounds and values. The more I learned about David's inner self, the more I was drawn to his warm smile. This day marked a turning point in our relationship. It didn't take long for us to get married. I have Michael to thank for making this happen. In that sense, and in future events, I can't thank Michael enough. Then came the day of the family meeting with my in-laws. Feeling anxious, I was met by my in-laws with great warmth and kindness. Their caring and considerate conversation eased my nerves. I'm so glad you could come. We've been looking forward to meeting you, Susan. I've cooked a lot, hoping today would be a special day. Mother-in-law Emily said, taking great care of me. My in-laws, like their eldest son David, were independent and very approachable. I was relieved and grateful for the enjoyable time at my in-laws. Our interactions continued, and they always supported our happiness, never imposing their views on marriage or children. Eventually, the topic of living together at the in-laws came up, but we had plans to build our own home. In fact, my grandfather left a house for me. My in-laws listened intently and nodded. My grandfather cherished me as his only granddaughter, and he left me a beautifully renovated house and land. He seemed to wait for the inheritance process to complete before passing away. The property was nearby and had increased in value due to redevelopment. But as someone experienced in real estate, I knew it was more beneficial to sell it to fund our dream home. Grateful for my grandfather's love, we were already considering selling it, as he had said the house was mine to live in or sell. After marriage, we moved there. However, it was far from work, and despite its good location, it wasn't practical to continue living there. As we planned to sell it, a significant change came into our lives. David, working in sales, was ordered to transfer. His company had branches nationwide, and he was the only suitable candidate. It was an official order, and he couldn't refuse. I'll come home every long weekend, and my parents are planning to visit. Could you take them out? It's okay if you don't overexert yourself. Father-in-law Brian and Emily are very nice. I don't mind going out with them, but it looks like we'll have to postpone selling the house. With my job to consider, David's assignment to work alone was decided. It was sudden, but I had to endure the loneliness and worry waiting for the day we could live together again. As David said, on the days off, my in-laws, especially Emily, would frequently come to visit. Emily, who had endured loneliness many times while raising young children when Brian was away on business trips, shared her experiences with me. You can still create family memories even without children. How about going out with me? Shopping might cheer you up. Let's go, Susan. Thanks to Emily, I didn't feel lonely. My weekends were even busier. However, I started to notice something troubling. Almost every day off, Emily would insist on going out. It was nice, but after a month, Emily's invitations became more forceful, regardless of my fatigue or household chores. I was hoping to rest this week. When I said that, Emily frowned as if I was being selfish. But it's fun to go out together, isn't it? 
or do you dislike going out with me? No, no, it's not that. But you've been taking me out every week. Don't you need a break, Emily? Emily looked sad. Even as I tried to clear up the misunderstanding, Emily wouldn't listen. I agreed reluctantly, and Emily smiled, acting as if she never insisted. My suspicions about Emily's behavior grew. The places she insisted on going were increasingly expensive. Shopping at brand stores and eating at upscale restaurants, and the bills fell on me. Emily often left the store first, leaving me no choice but to pay. There was never a thank you or a promise to pay me back later. Sure, I have a house and a good salary, so savings weren't an issue. But David and I had always been frugal, so Emily's extravagance felt odd. Even when both in-laws were there, it was the same. In fact, with Brian, my financial burden only increased. I knew I had to address it, but it was hard to discuss with David. David had said, I'll definitely come home on the long weekends. But his new office was busy, and he rarely managed to return. Mom says you've been going out every week. Are you managing okay? Doesn't seem like there's anything to worry about. David's video call showed his tired eyes and thinner cheeks. His work fatigue was evident. Feeling guilty about bringing up the issue with Emily, I ended up being overly optimistic. Emily's been really good to me. Take care of yourself, David. I'm fine, don't worry. While well, I downplayed it to David, I couldn't refuse to pay for outings with my in-laws. Their behavior escalated until one day when I said, I can't go out today. Emily said something unexpected. Then, can you lend me some money? Pay? For you? Just a little, really. I've already made a reservation at a restaurant. I'll take another friend instead, so could you cover what I'm short? I wanted to refuse, but that would have made things worse. Resigned, I opened my wallet, but Emily never acted this way in front of David. Have you thought about asking David? When I hinted this to Emily, that's shameful to tell David. Her response shocked me. It was clear she felt it was okay to ask me, not David. I gave up on Emily as her demands for money became routine. At least giving her some pocket money, she stopped dragging me out. I knew it was a big problem, but my attempts to communicate with Emily were exhausting. Her behavior became more bizarre. She'd show up unannounced, inspecting the inside and outside of the house, making me feel like my privacy was invaded. Is this from your grandfather, Susan? This furniture? It's wonderful you can afford such luxury. Some furniture were antiques my grandfather liked. Emily seemed to enjoy them, admiring them as if they were her own. This is mine and David's home. I finally started to consider confiding about Emily's actions. David might be surprised, but how I wish we could find a way to deal with Emily together. Emily's actions are far from pleasant. Even as in-laws, it's an invasion of privacy. However, around the same time, the duration of David's assignment was determined. Just a little longer to bear it. And when David returns, the in-laws asking for money would likely end. A glimmer of hope sprouted in my heart. David was working hard every day, so I just needed to be patient a little longer. But as I eagerly awaited David's return, things took an unexpected turn. What? David collapsed? And he's in the hospital? I was stunned. The call came from a colleague at his new location, and I hurried to the hospital. Perhaps due to overwork, David suddenly suffered a heart attack. Though rushed to the hospital by ambulance, it was too late. My kind, healthy David passed away from an unforeseen attack. <laughs> I couldn't grasp the reality as I faced his funeral. I don't remember much. Overwhelmed by grief, Michael rushed over, taking care of most things. I'm sorry, Michael. Even though you lost David, too, you're helping so much. It's David's funeral. Of course I should help. How about the land? Is the house ready? We talked while cleaning up after the funeral. I nodded and said, Everything's perfect. Then a few days after David's funeral, my in-laws came to the house. But it was clear they weren't there to console me. It's a shame about David, but we're here for you. Don't worry. Emily's face had a strangely unpleasant smile. To my astonishment, she had arranged a truck, packed to the brim with furniture and belongings from her house. I was too shocked and confused to speak. This looked like a move. 
Emily and her husband were planning to move in without discussing it with me? Why were they doing this? But the answer was clear. Are you after my land? I voiced my concern amidst the confusion. Emily showed a cold smile. The land value has soared. We've been eyeing this house for a long time. In fact, Susan, it's thanks to this inheritance you married David. We allowed the marriage because you inherited it. I was overwhelmed with despair, lost for words. Emily, you mean you're moving in with me? Excuse me? What nonsense are you talking about? I asked in confusion, and Emily got angry. David's death was unexpected, but even if it hadn't happened, Emily intended to take this house. My in-laws were trying to replace me as the landowner. They assumed I'd leave the house because David was gone. Now that David is gone, you'll go back to your parents, right? It'd be sad to leave this house empty, so we'll live here. That's why I'm telling you not to worry. Emily's smile twisted in distortion. While feeling fear, I pointed out Emily's mistake. But the house is already sold. I restrained my laughter at Emily's misunderstanding, but couldn't hide my unpleasant smile. Emily, in turn, Huh? Froze. Just then, a different moving company's truck arrived. Sorry. We're here to deliver to this house. A burly mover came down, speaking to us due to the confusion of another truck being present. Emily's movers also came down. Realizing something was amiss due to the arrival of the other truck, they looked bewildered. Both in-laws were flustered and incoherent. Arguing with everyone wouldn't resolve anything. Seeing my in-laws in panic, I began to regain my composure. Then, I promptly gave instructions to move the truck. This house has already been sold, and the contract finalized. A new family is moving in, so you can't bring their belongings into someone else's house, right? As the movers were astonished, a luxurious car pulled up. Out came a wealthy-looking couple and their children. In fact, the land was no longer mine. They were the new owners. My in-laws were increasingly confused, unable to comprehend what was happening. Please move the truck quickly. The new occupants can't start their work. Somehow, I managed to get Emily's truck moved, and the movers immediately began their work, efficiently transporting brand new furniture according to the planned procedure. Emily and her husband, unable to accept this, started to persistently pester me at the entrance. The occupants, realizing the situation, took their family back to the car and then came over to confront us. Who are you? We bought this house. Please let the truck go soon. I hadn't expected my in-laws to visit, so I apologized repeatedly to reassure the new owners. But Emily and her husband didn't leave. They pushed past us and barged into the house. Of course, the house had completely changed from what they knew. None of the furniture my husband and I used was left. Emily was shocked at the sight and started to make a scene. What's this? The house is empty. The antique furniture? The lighting? I love those. What's going on? Emily was infuriated. Unable to understand what was happening, the occupant finally snapped. I'll call the police. Frustrated, Brian quickly grabbed Emily and retreated. Once away from the scene, the heated Emily quieted down somewhat. First, I apologized to the occupants. There could still be future problems, they warned. So I provided them with my in-laws' names and addresses to somehow resolve the situation. Feeling a deep sense of exhaustion, I still had things to explain to my in-laws. I went back to them and calmly explained that the move had been completed just days before David's death. The plan was always to sell the house along with the land. It was the original plan, though it had been paused due to David's solo assignment. The smooth progression of the plan was due to a certain background. It was Michael who encouraged our decision. Confused by my in-laws' change, especially their demand for money, I didn't want to worry David and couldn't consult him, leading to days of despondency. Michael noticed and came to my rescue. Michael, who didn't get along with his parents, if you're in trouble, I'll help, had offered. Trusting Michael, who promised to keep it a secret for the sake of our marital harmony, I decided to confide everything. Upon hearing it, Michael was furious with his parents. Michael, David's brother and my colleague, understood their scheme well. For him, David was his only family, and he saw me, David's wife, as family too. 
My parents will either try to live in that house eventually, or conveniently kick both of you out to make it their own. According to Michael, both parents were pretentious and unscrupulous, especially Emily, who was selfish and malicious under her refined exterior. Hearing these intense stories about his own family from Michael, David never knew the side of his parents because they hid it from him, the heir. Anyway, to avoid losing it to them, Michael suggested we sell the land early. I agreed with Michael's suggestion and decided to proceed with the sale. Even though it was a valuable inheritance for my grandfather, I didn't want it to become an obstacle for us. Rather, because it was important, I didn't want to leave any troubles. Of course, it wasn't a decision made on my own. I had discussed it with David while he was alive and had his agreement. At that time, David learned about all his parents' actions. Though I didn't want to tell him, I couldn't complete the sale alone. But David understood why I couldn't consult him and condemned his parents' actions. I'm sorry I didn't notice. If it's okay with you, Susan, let's finish the sale before my parents make a move. It's a shame about the house inherited from grandfather-in-law. No, it's okay. If it's going to cause trouble, grandfather would agree to let it go, too. I decided to sell the land, not to protect my relationship with my in-laws, but to safeguard the future I had with David. Michael, a real estate expert, exerted his efforts in the sale, finding the ideal buyers. My task was to find a new place to move as soon as possible and act naturally to prevent my in-laws from finding out. The house, while lived in, was almost like new, so we were able to keep the price reasonable. Thus, a buyer was quickly found and the sale was swiftly concluded. They were the family that had just arrived. Originally, I had planned to wait in our new home for David's return. David was pleased about the sale, so it was only regrettable he wasn't here. The movers efficiently transported the furniture. The evicted in-laws watched from a distance as the move continued smoothly. They stood dumbfounded for a while, but that couldn't last forever. The movers they had hired, angry and confused, demanded an explanation. From their perspective, the booking mistake was inconceivable. I can't believe this is happening. It's a breach of contract. They questioned my in-laws, who in their panic struggled to explain. Eventually, the household goods had to be taken back, but because of the unexpected situation, a significant surcharge was apparently billed. Emily, finally understanding the situation, clung to me, trembling. This is the wife of David's house, so it's our home too, right? The situation is odd, isn't it? She tried to persuade me with her strained excuses, but I ignored them and left with only my hand luggage. The land was already the new family's property, not mine anymore, so I had nothing to answer. David's memorial service proceeded without delay. I encountered my in-laws there, but even though they seemed like they wanted to say something about the house, they never did and eventually left surreptitiously. I had no obligation to speak to them anymore, so we barely talked. I lived my days in peace. In a new house, a small home, where I was supposed to restart with David. I faced the grief of losing him. With substantial savings from the sale, the plan to build our own home vanished without David. Returning to work, I immersed myself in the few memories I had with David and slowly began to look forward to a positive future. Meanwhile, my in-laws, especially Emily, must have been accumulating unresolved grievances. I didn't want any more involvement with them so I didn't inform them of my new residence. Unable to interact with me, Emily's frustration only grew. She had always pretended in front of David and now couldn't turn to Michael, whom she didn't get along with. Not knowing my whereabouts added to her stress, which kept piling up until Emily lost her balance. One night, Emily committed a heinous act by pouring gasoline around the sold house. Fortunately, a passing neighbor Sensing something amiss, apprehended her before anything worse could happen. After being reported to the police and found with the old paper and a lighter, Emily was arrested for attempted arson. The new occupants, furious upon learning she was the woman who had intruded on moving day, angrily insisted on pressing charges, contacting me as well. I apologized profusely, but it was for the terrifying experience they almost had, not for Emily's attempted arson. In the end, Emily couldn't escape legal action due to her obsession with the house. 
I managed to be forgiven after repeated apologies, promising such an incident would never happen again. Emily, who had grown up in luxury and always had whatever she wanted, became frustrated when she couldn't have the house. That's why, I want that house! This unfulfilled desire turned into distorted jealousy. Unable to let go of the house and land, she resorted to crime and eventually ended up in prison. Brian, who should have been her support, ended their marriage in a dispute following her arrest. So when her sentence was over, Emily had no home to return to. But that was the outcome of her own actions. Michael, lonely after losing David, said, Susan, having you makes it bearable. Though my relationship with my in-laws was severed, I hadn't lost my entire family. For David, who I believed was watching over me from heaven, I resolved to live peacefully.